The way you've described this makes it sound like in nature, there's an, in, it makes it sound like in nature, if we are estimating things, there is a natural bias or a natural tendency to overestimate. But that's not true, is it? I, I think um, that there is something quite subtle going on here, which is a good point. So let's get some more paper and I'll... Let me first explain what would have happened if we'd done this experiment in Fahrenheit instead of Celsius. Right. So what that means is that the origin changes, right? So what used to be zero is now 32, right? So zero is moved. And how does that change the story? Well, if I drew this picture again, but the origin was now further away, then when I draw my circle of constant radius, it's now much more like a, a, a dividing line, dividing this thing into nearly equal sized pieces, right? So, Because it's a more subtle curve, because it's, yeah, right. Exactly. Yeah. So the proportion of the time that I overestimate the length of my vector is going to be, you know, only just a bit more than a half. So the effect is, is, is much more diminished in this setting. But conversely, if I was using um, uh, you know, a, a different temperature scale where the origin was much closer to what I was interested in estimating, or if I had some prior idea what sort of temperatures might be, right, and I choose my origin appropriately, then the picture would look much more like this. So when I draw my circle now, you can see a much larger proportion of the states are further away from the origin than closer. So what this means is in the real world, if I've got some prior idea what the temperature ought to be, right, and you came in and said 20 degrees was a sensible number, well, I can kind of adjust my expectations accordingly by moving the origin of my problem to 20 degrees in this case, right? And that would have the effect of increasing the effectiveness of this shrinkage technique. So, so we've learned that the James Stein estimator is always better than just using the natural estimator in dimension three and above. Okay. Now, does it get more effective the higher the dimension or? Uh, yeah, it does. Right. It does. Yeah. But what's even more surprising maybe is that this James Stein estimator, even that is inadmissible. So there's something that's always better than this. Right, now I can show you one sneaky little way we can make this even better. So suppose that our vector of measurements was very close to the origin. Now, what that means is that the norm term here is going to be close to zero, meaning this fraction here will blow up, and actually we could end up with a negative pre-factor here, right? So what that means is I take my vector of measurements and I would actually flip it over to the other side of the origin, right? And that would be a silly thing to do. So we can always improve this James Stein estimator by saying, if this pre-factor is negative, just ignore it, just map everything to zero, okay? So there's a, a nice symbol for this. If I put this subscript plus, that means take the maximum of whatever's here and zero. Okay. And you can show that this James Stein estimator has a mean squared error that's uniformly lower than the mean squared error of the James Stein estimator in dimension three and above. Now, even this James Stein estimator, let's call it the James Stein plus estimator, is inadmissible. And you can build a sequence of increasingly more complicated estimators that are each strictly better than the one that comes before it. So there's a, a really deep story about shrinkage here that goes you know, far beyond what our intuition, I think, would suggest. Nice. I can tell you're excited about this. <laughs> <laughs> this still, the statisticians still get excited about this after all these years, do they? Well, I, I, mean, I certainly do. Um, so, so, I mean, Charles Stein made loads of discoveries, and actually a lot of what I do, my day-to-day -day research, is driven by one of his other discoveries, which we've not even touched on today. But you know, he's, he's, he's a, you know, an extremely influential statistician. I'm, I'm very pleased that I'm able to tell this story today. So you might be asking, what is it that makes this property work in high dimensions? What's special about high dimensions? And really what's the root cause of this phenomenon is the idea that lengths and volumes behave very differently in high dimensions. And one way of seeing this is to consider, let's say, a, a square or a cube of side length two, right? So if you measure the distance from one corner of a cube to the opposite corner, and then you see how that distance behaves with the dimension of the cube, it's going to increase like the square root of the dimension. That's how lengths behave. But if you consider the volume of a cube, well, let's work it out, right? So the volume of a square is the length of the, the, the side times the length of the height. So it's like um, two times two in our two by two cube. That'll be four. Um, 
In three dimensions, two times two times two will be eight. And you can see what happens is the volume of a cube is actually increasing exponentially quickly in dimension. So that's very different to increasing like the square root of the dimension. So lengths and volumes are really very different in high dimensions. And what's going on here is that the volume of the sphere in the picture that is further away from the origin is getting closer and closer to one, like, you know, the proportion of that, that mass that's further away from the origin is getting close to one, but the lengths are not really changing in, in anything like the comparable scale. Yeah, nice.